in Luke chapter 13, we have a very interesting story in the Bible. It's about, in fact, about honesty. Before I tell you that story, I, I want to share with you something a friend of mine told me one day that's marked me since then. He's a businessman in the community, a friend of mine, maybe some of you have heard of him, is Johnson Napoleon. And one time we were talking about spiritual life. He told me something that mocked me. Um, he told me that rich people and poor people do not view God the same way. He told me that rich people's lives could be pictured like a normal triangle. The bottom of the triangle represents man. And the top of the triangle represents God. And he said, people who are doing well in life, their life is like almost like a normal triangle. They expect a lot from man and very little from God. Poor people, so life is like an inverted triangle. They expect little from man and a lot from God. And it is true. Jesus gives an illustration of that principle in Luke chapter 13. While he was invited to a party, he noticed that a lot of people were trying to get the best seats. And he started not talking about, he started talking about not seeking the best seats when you are invited to a place. And while he was giving that parable, there are a few people sitting at the table with him. And said, blessed are those who will come and eat at the kingdom of God. And Jesus told them that story so they can understand. Because I guess they realize the same way that it was easy for them to get a good seat at that party. In the kingdom of heaven, it will be just as easy. And Jesus told them a story. He said a certain man was giving a great supper. And he told all of his close friends in advance that he would be giving that supper. He invited them. If it were in today's world, he would have sent them invitation cards, maybe by mail or by email or WhatsApp. But at any rate, he invited them ahead of time. And those guys assured the man that they were going to come. So he knew how many guests he would have. So he went on his way and started his preparations. He made sure that he cleared out his living room so he would have enough space for everybody. He went and purchased extra uh, vessels and utensils, etc., so that they were able to use spoons and forks and knives. 
He didn't have enough chairs, so he went out and rented chairs. He made sure that his servants, his maid, and butlers went to uh, the market, went for the grocery and shopping weeks in advance to make sure there is enough, that, that there would be enough provision for the party. When the time of the party was drawing near, since uh, they didn't have WhatsApp in those days and they didn't have text messages in those days, he sent his servant to go and get all the guests that he had invited and reminding them that the time is close. So he told them, he told his servant, go and tell them everything is ready. Come to the party. So he went to the house of the first guy. He didn't find him home. So he went to the, to the guys, to the second guy's house. He didn't find him home. And he went to the third house and didn't find anybody. And someone told him that all of those guys were gathering at a place and they were, you know, they were hanging out together. So he went to the place where they were hanging out. And he said, guys, I've been, um, you know, in all of your houses. I've knocked on your doors. Nobody answered. And you guys are all here. I'm, I'm glad to see you all. But I want my master sent me to tell you that all is ready. So the party is, uh, you know, is in about an hour. So make sure that you guys come. Because it was a dinner. It was a great supper. It was a dinner. So... It was probably late in the afternoon or it was starting to get dark. The first guy said, wow, you know, I won't be able to make it because I have bought a field. I must go and inspect my field. The other one said, then he turned to the second one, but the second one said, wow, you know, I just bought two pairs a five pairs of oxen. Um, you know, so I got to check my oxen to make sure. And he turned to the third one and the third one said, huh, I just got married. So I can't participate. If you look at the reasoning of each and every one of them very closely, you will realize that they were just empty excuses the first one said I've bought a field I've bought a field I have to go and inspect it but how many people inspect real estate at night it's supper so if you have a field to inspect you're not going to expect it at night you're going to expect it in the morning the second one said I have bought ten two uh, five pairs of oxen 10 oxen in total. I have bought five pair of oxen. I got to go and try them. Nobody buys a car without trying it first. So how are you going to buy five pairs of oxen that are going to work and you never tried them? The other one says, I, I, just got, I just got married. How many people get married and instead of going to the honeymoon... You go and hang out with friends. If you just got married, you should be in your honeymoon, not hanging out with your friends. So each and every one of them gave an excuse. So the reality is, they simply were not interested in the party. Each, of, each and every one of them came up with an excuse. And when the servant went back to the master and told him, the excuse of the first one and the excuse of the second one, the excuse of the third one. The Bible says the master was angry. He said, I can't believe this. They told me that they would be at the party and all of them declined to come. But he said, I will not waste my food. I will not waste my provision. And I will not cancel the party. So he said, go to the street. Get the lame. Get the maimed. Get the poor, get the blind, get everybody you can get in the streets. Gather them and have them come to my party. 
he brought the first group to the party and the place wasn't filled. He said, go back out and find some more lame and find some more blind and find some more poor people. Gather them until the entire place is full. And when the place was full, he closed the doors and says, they will not eat of my supper. Even if they change their minds, now my place is full. They won't be able to come in and participate in the kingdom, in the supper. And Jesus said, that's how the kingdom of God will be. You'll be amazed to see the kinds of people that you will see. In, in heaven, you will be amazed who is present and who's absent. Some of the people you thought would be present in heaven, you'll be amazed to see that they are not there. And some of the people that you thought would never make it to heaven, you'll be amazed when you get there to see them. What was the difference between those two groups of people? How come a, a group, the first group, did not make it to the party, but the second one made it? Because the first group were close friends of the man. It was, if you are somebody's close friend and they're having a party, it's normal for them to invite you. As a result, they thought it was, the, the invitation was normal. They thought that they deserved to be in the party. And anything you think you deserve in life, you will undervalue. <laughs> anything you think you deserve in life, you will not appreciate. Now, I know some of you, it might be difficult, some of you to relate. Uh, those of you who grew up in the United States. But I'll tell you, those of us who grew up in Haiti, when we open our fridge and we see there is food in that fridge, <laughs> if you were born here, you don't appreciate that. But if you weren't born here, are you guys with me? And I can open my fridge and find food in that fridge. Every time I see food in that fridge, I lift up my hands and say, praise the Lord. Because I realize it's grace. Somebody say grace. Anything you think you deserve, anything you think is normal, you will not really value and you will not appreciate and as a result you might um, even disdain it you disdain it you might minimize it because you think it's normal you don't appreciate it to its just value you know those of us who are here we are so blessed and we don't know we are blessed we are so blessed and we don't know we are blessed. Not only because we are blessed simply by being in the United States, but I'll go a little bit further with you. Uh, you know, simply, you know, you've been, some of you have been through hard times in life. And there are people who, who did not go through half of what you went through and lost their mind. You heard what I said? There are people who didn't go through half of what you went through, lost their mind. Put a bullet through their brain. A long time ago when we started the church, I had a habit of praying very late at night in the area. For, uh, I would say about three, at least three years. 
I used to pray at night, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. I would usually walk the streets of North Miami and just pray. So I had done that for a number of years. And I remember one night I had, and during those nights, I had all kinds of interesting encounters. It's, it's interesting the kind of people that you meet at 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. But I remember one time I was on 125th and I was just walking and praying. It was in the middle of the night. And as I was walking, I noticed a young lady um, who was standing close to the, uh, where the railroad tracks are, very close, on 125th where the railroad tracks are. And uh, I was walking, and as I was walking, I noticed that there was a lady who was smoking. As I walked past by la that lady, she took the cigarette out of her mouth and handed the cigarette to me. At first, I was shocked. I'm like, I don't know if I look like a smoker or something like that. But I realized she was drunk. As I looked at her very closely, I realized she was drunk. So I took the cigarette from her hand, threw it away, and I said, lady, it's one o'clock in the morning. You're drunk and you're smoking. So there must be something wrong. I don't know what it is, but if you're not praying, like myself, at one o'clock in the morning, drunk and smoking, there is something wrong. And I said, I, I told her, I don't know what, you don't have to tell me your story. You don't have to tell me what your problem is. But I know Jesus is the problem solver. So I don't care what you're going through. But I know a person who can help you. So I sat down with that lady, had a conversation with her. I sat down on the bench that was not too far. Had a conversation with her. And offered her Jesus. And said, would you like to give Jesus your life? And she said, yes. I prayed with her. And I went my way. She went her way. I, I, I got her info so I can follow up with her. She, I, got, I went my way. She went her way. A few days later, I took a few members from the church. And I went to her house to visit. To see how she was doing. When I went there... I realized uh, her husband was at the house. So I told her husband about the encounter that I had with, the, with, with uh, his wife a few days ago. She gave her life to Jesus. And I said, what about you? How are you doing? Well, he said um, her issue is drinking and, uh, and smoking, etc. Me, my issue is that I keep on going, you know, I go back and forth, um, you know, at Jackson Hospital, psychiatric, uh, you know, you know I'm, I'm having, I have a lot of mental issues. So he came with a lot of pills that he was taking. He showed me the pills. And he said, you know, for five years I've been going in and out of Jackson Hospital because they have diagnosed me with, you know, he told me, you know, psychosis, paranoia, and he gave me all the names. And I told him the same thing that I told his wife. I said, I don't know what's at the root of this problem. But I know somebody who can solve problems. His name is Jesus. Would you like to give him your life? He said, yes. So we pray with the family. But as I was leaving, I, you know, you know, there's something inside of me. I wanted to know what was going on with that family. Why was the wife drinking and smoking one o'clock in the morning and in the morning and the husband, you know, was going back and forth in the hospital for mental issues. So I was wondering what was at the root of this problem. So I turned back and asked the husband, what do you think is the cause of all of those issues in the family? And he told me five years ago, a little bit more than five years ago, my wife got pregnant 
we were, we were expecting our second child. He had a beautiful girl in the house, but we were expecting our second child, a boy. I was talking to that boy. Every time I came home at night, you know, I was touching my wife's, uh, you know, uh, um, st uh, belly. And he said I was, uh, uh, you know, singing for that baby and praying for that baby. And, you know, you know, because, you know, we thought it was going to be a baby boy, et cetera, et cetera. And then he said, my wife lost the child. When his wife lost the child, she started drinking. She started smoking. Her life went totally upside down. And him, he totally lost his mind. He went through a trial. That family went through a trial. And that trial affected them mentally so much that one started drinking. The other one, you know, became mentally affected. And I paused and thought, my goodness. I know so many people just at Tabernacle of Glory who's lost children. I know so many people who've been through trouble that they can never explain. But for some reason, the Lord has been so faithful to them. You've been through headache, you've been through heartaches, you've been through fire, you've been through the water. Some of you have been through hell, so to speak. But God never allowed you to lose your mind. There are some things that you think are normal. I've come to tell you they are not normal. If you haven't lost your mind, ah, hallelujah, after you've gone through all that you went through, if you haven't lost your mind, if you haven't started drinking, if you didn't pull, if you didn't pull, uh, you know, a gun uh, over your head, uh, it's not, I'm coming to tell you, it's not normal. It's been the grace of God. The grace of God kept you. The grace of God kept you saying the grace of God kept you in the right mind the grace of God protected you somebody shout glory a lot of times we are blessed we don't even realize your sanity is one of the greatest blessings that God can ever give you even if he never gave you money, he never gave you a house, and he never gave you a car, and he never, never gave you a million dollars, but the fact you went through all that you went through, and you still had your right mind, you didn't try to put your shoes in your head this morning, you knew that your shoes went for your feet. Ah! Somebody say grace! Somebody say grace! Somebody say grace! If I am still alive, it's God's grace. If I can still worship, it's God's grace. If you can still ask me, how are you? And I'm saying, I'm doing fine. It's God's grace. Hallelujah. I could have lost my mind. I could have been in jail. I could have been dead. But I'm still alive. Somebody shout grace. It's grace. You know, the biggest lesson I had learned from that guy, the biggest lesson I had learned from that guy, huh, oh, it's very easy for you to lose your mind. It's very easy for a person to go crazy. It's very easy for a person to go crazy. That mind of yours, it's very easy to lose it. I told you in walking on 125th at night, I did that, as I, as I said, for a good three years or so, if not more. You meet all kinds of interesting people. I remember there was a young lady, not, not, not young lady in the sense of young adult, it was a lady in her 50s. But I used to see that lady every time I would be walking at night. 
on 125th in the streets of North Miami, especially on 125th, I would meet that lady around 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. I always see her dressed with a white gown and um, in, in pushing a car. Sometimes I'd try to talk to her, I'd try to say hi, but she never answered me. But she was just pushing a car. Everything that she owns was in that car, uh, was in that car. And she always dressed in, in white. And I tried to talk to her, she never answered. And one day, that lady was pushing that cart, and I was in front of the church. And it was an afternoon, I was in front of the church. I was talking to, uh, you know, I was talking to somebody at the church. And I said, you know, at night, when I'm praying, every night, I see that lady. But I tried to talk to her, she never responded. She said, yeah, she said, I know that lady. I said, what's the story? She said, that lady, you see pushing that car, is a professional. She has a professional degree. She's a nurse. She went to nursing school, got herself a good job. She was working at Jackson Hospital. She bought a house. But somebody was jealous of the fact that she bought that house and went and did some witchcraft. And as a result, she lost her mind. She still dresses like a nurse. But she's homeless. You know how many, how, you know how many times people try to. <laughs> you know how many attempt. You know how many attempt the enemy has made over your life. How many people have tried to hex you? How many people have tried to work their voodoo, their witchcraft, their whatever in you? But God protected you. He put a, a wall of protection, a wall of fire around you. Somebody say grace. Say grace. Say grace. Sometimes we are blessed. We don't even know it. We don't know how much God has protected us. We don't know how much is provided for us. When, um, during the recession, um, under George Bush, I was watching television. And I remember, there's a story that mocked me. A guy who had been in a job for many years, I think it was over 20 years. And it was a recession and they were laying people off. And they laid them off. This guy got laid off after 20 something years in his job. Now walking back home, he realized that he won't be able to pay his mortgage as easily as he used to. He won't be able to put the same things that he used to put in his fridge. He won't be able to buy the same clothes that he used to buy. So this man, because he lost his job, and I guess in his mind, he realized he'll no longer be able to afford the lifestyle that he used to have. He walked home, took a gun, shot his wife, shot his children, and shot himself because he lost a job. How many times you lost your job? <laughs> but God protected your mind. Some of you, you, you can't talk about losing a job because you don't have a job to lose. But still, you haven't lost your mind. Some of you may not even have the right papers in this country. Some of you have a hard time expressing yourself right. But God has protected your mind. Somebody say grace. Say grace. Say grace. Sometimes we think we think being blessed is a million dollars. We think being blessed is a nice house. We think being blessed is a nice car and a great position. But just because you're in your, in your right mind, it's a great blessing from the Lord. Somebody shout grace. Shout grace. Somebody shout grace. Why did I take time to emphasize this? Because often when God blesses us, we just take those blessings as normal. Until they are taken away from us, then we realize it was never normal. It was a tremendous 
grace. A right mind is a tremendous grace, but you take it as normal, you realize its value when you lose it. Those guys didn't value the party of the king because they thought all of those blessings were normal. The reason they didn't enter the kingdom is because they thought they deserved the kingdom. They didn't enter into the party. They missed the party because they thought they deserved the party. But the other group, why did they make it? Because those guys lived in the street. Those guys were homeless. Those guys were men. They were blind. They were, they were uh, 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 you know, they were handicapped. Now, I know some of you in the United States, you might have, have a hard time relating with that. Because, you know, handicapped, by and large, are Taken, taken care of well in the United States of America. But if you understand what is a handicapped person is, you got to go to a third world country. You got to go to a poor country and understand the life of a handicapped. When you were blind, when you are blind in a poor country, when you are maimed in a poor country, when you are lame in the poor country, you are the worst of the worst. You are left to yourself because you can't work. You just, you, you just sleep in the streets. You sleep on cardboard. You sleep on the bridge. You could be poor, but when you are handicapped, you're the poorest of the poor. So those people never get invited to any party. Nobody ever invites them in their home. Nobody ever invites them to dinner. Nobody ever invites them to a banquet. So when somebody came and said, you are invited to a dinner, everything is ready. The table is ready. There is macaroni. Are you guys with me? There is Italian food. There is bread. There is wine. They took it as a privilege. They rejoiced in the fact that they received the invitation because they knew they didn't deserve it. The only way you can make it into the kingdom of God is to realize that you don't deserve the kingdom. Is to realize that you, didn't, you don't deserve the kingdom. But let me go, go a little bit further with you. Why, why did those guys feel, feel honored? What, do, what did those four categories of people have in common? The text says in Luke chapter 13, he invited the poor, the lame, the maimed, and the blind. Maimed, those missing one hand, lame, missing one foot, blind. And then the previous part. What do those four categories have in common? The poor, the maimed, the blind, and the lame. The poor, the maimed, the blind. What, 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 do, what do all of those people have in common? They, they, all, they all know there is something wrong with them. A blind person knows there's something wrong. A lame person, he can look at himself. And realize he's missing a limb. He knows there's something wrong. A main person who's missing a hand knows there is something wrong. A person who's in extreme poverty knows there is something wrong. They might be, not be able to put their hands on it, but they know there is something wrong. Because they knew that there was something wrong with them. That's what allowed them to make it into the kingdom. The other group didn't make it because they didn't think there was anything wrong with them. And they were fooled by, they were so fooled, they were deceived. Because you see the second group had knew that there was something wrong. They, felt, they knew that there was something wrong with their body. The first group, there was something wrong with their body. The second group, pardon me, there was something wrong with their body. The first group, there was something wrong with their soul. And the inward problems are greater than the outward problems. 
outward issues will not keep you out of the kingdom of God, but inward issues will keep you out of the kingdom of God. But, 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 but the other ones, the handicapped realized that, but the other ones didn't. I'm going to close with this, and we've got to be very careful with this. Beloved, the more blessed we are in life, the more disconnected we tend to be with ourselves spiritually. We've got to be very careful with the blessings that we receive from God. Because the more blessed we are, the more we tend to be spiritually disconnected, or let me rephrase it that way, the more blessed we are, the more, the less, the more blessed we are, the less we are honest with ourselves. The more blessed we are, the more disconnected we are, and the more dishonest we are with ourselves. Jesus had said one time, it is very difficult for the rich to make it into the kingdom. He didn't say it was impossible because he says all things are possible with God. But he said it's difficult. You know why, why it's difficult? Because when we are blessed, when we have a lot, we are so content with what we have. We don't think there is anything wrong. As long as we have a good job and we have a good car and we have, a, you know, we, we don't think there is anything wrong. In fact, that's why I, I go back to my friend's illustration. You see, the more blessed we are, the more we expect from men. The more we expect from men. The more we expect from men. But when, you see, when, if, 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 if um, you know, if I have a good job and I have a good insurance, I'm sick, but I have a good assurance. I have a good insur uh, insurance and I have money. So if I'm sick, I go to the doctor. If I don't have food, I just go to Whole Foods and get myself some food. So I don't have to trust God. I don't have to put my faith in God. If I'm sick, I go to my doctor. Are you guys with me? If I have a problem, I get myself a lawyer. If I, got, I want to eat, I just go to the supermarket. And as a result, because we have so many things, so many resources available to us, if we are not be careful, we will depend on men rather than God. But the person who can't afford a doctor, you know when he's sick, what he's got? to do? Well, I got to find myself some 40 days yet. I got myself to set some spots. I got to be in the presence of God. As a result, they can, they can end up being more sensitive to the presence of God because they expect, they expect less from men and more from God. Today's teaching is about spiritual honesty. To make it into the kingdom of God, you got to be honest with yourself spiritually. Never let your blessings fool you. Never let your blessings deceive you. Never make, let the fact that you're doing well make you think because, you, because you're well outwardly, make you think that you're well inwardly. So even when you're doing well, you got to come to the presence of the Lord and say, Lord, I thank you for the nice suit, and I thank you for the car, and I thank you for a roof over my head, but Lord, how am I doing spiritually? Because all of that is great, but in here, Lord, in here, in here, inside of me, how am I doing? I can be healthy physically, and I'm sick in my soul. Lord, thanks for the blessings, but how am I doing here? When you start asking those questions, well, you start being honest with yourself spiritually. Spiritually. We got to be careful with the danger of being blessed. Sometimes the more blessed we are, the more disconnected we are with ourselves. We no longer see ourselves the way that God sees us. So what do we do? Let me give you three advice real quick that will help you to increase your spiritual honesty so you could be honest with yourself. Number one, read the word of God. The one of the very first thing that's going to help you to be honest with yourself spiritually 
is to constantly read the word of God. Read your word constantly. When, in the morning, wake up and put some time aside to open that Bible and read it. Why? Because James says the word of God is like a mirror. The word of God is like a mirror. Just like when you, when you stand in a mirror, it shows you your physical body. When you open the word of God, it shows you your spiritual body. It's a mirror. It shows you where you are. You're going to read a verse that's going to convict you. When you thought you were good, you're going to read a word. And it's going to convict you. So number one, read the word of God. Number two, spend time in prayer. And when you pray, don't just talk. Listen to the voice of God. Listen to the voice of God. Why? Because God is the truth. God is truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if you listen to his voice, you're going to hear the truth about you. It's going to break through your self-deceptions, and you're going to hear the truth. You know, I don't know if that has ever happened to you, that you go to the Lord in prayer. You know, you, you spend some time, you know, with the Lord in prayer. You know, and the Lord just, the Lord tells you things that if a friend of yours had told you, <laughs> you yeah, you probably would have, you probably would have slapped them. I mean, the Lord tells you things, you know, he just disses you. The Lord just disses you real bad. He tells you things that nobody would have ever dared to tell you. But you know you've heard his voice. When you spend time in the presence of God, he'll tell you the truth about your life. So if you want to be honest with yourself, spend time with the word. If you want to be honest with yourself, spend time in listening to his voice because he'll tell you the truth. Number three, if you want to be honest with yourself, if you want to be honest with yourself, welcome corrections from other people. Sometimes the Lord will tell you the truth himself. Sometimes he'll put the truth in the heart of somebody else to tell you. And if you will respond to that truth, it will change your life. It will change your life. Amen? Amen. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that we would be among those who make it in the kingdom. And we, we learned this morning, the only way we make it into the kingdom is if we realize there is something wrong. As long as we think everything is fine spiritually, we'll never really participate in the great party that you have set up for us. May we be like those who realize that there is something wrong. There's something wrong with me. I don't know what it is, but there is something wrong. As long as we stay honest with ourselves, we stay honest with reality, as long as we admit the fact that our prayer life is not where it's supposed to be, as long as we admit the fact we struggle with lust sometimes, as long as we admit the fact we struggle with lying sometimes. As long as we admit the fact, we struggle with jealousy and anger sometimes. As long as we realize there is something wrong, we are eligible to make it in the kingdom. The problem comes when we see nothing wrong. It means that we've lost touch with reality. Father, help us in the name of Jesus Christ. To never lose touch with reality. Give us the gift of honesty. In Jesus' name. Shekinah App. Téléchargez-le. Kounia.